Good evening and welcome. My name is Cara O'Sullivan and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Assistant Director of Continuing Education. Thanks to each of you for joining us for our final webinar of the spring semester. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this by offering presentations such as this one, as well as online courses, videos, podcasts, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our summer STM online crossroad courses are now enrolling. Courses begin July 21st, and courses include adult faith formation, teaching religion to children, teaching religion to adolescents, the Gospel of John, and a new course on St. Mary of Mandela. If you're interested in learning more about our online courses or would like to enroll in a course, please visit our website, bc.edu slash crossroads. We have included this link in the chat. Thanks to our speakers for granting us permission to record today's webinar. As soon as the recording of today's presentation is available for viewing, likely within a month, we will notify all registered participants of the availability of the recording. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Please feel free to enter a question into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. Please click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. Many thanks to Dot and Michaela, graduate students here at the STM for assisting us with the closed captioning for us today. Now I invite Megan Lovett, Director of Continuing Education to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Cara, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers on this spo special Spotlight on Ministry event and our final webinar of the spring semester, The Power to Preach, a conversation about ordaining women as deacons. So I do have the honor of introducing the three co-directors of Discerning Deacons, which is this project working to engage Catholics in the active discernment of our church about women in the diaconate. Our first speaker is Ellie Hidalgo, she has served for 12 years as a pastoral associate and previously as a pastoral assistant for Dolores Mission Catholic Church and School, a Jesuit parish in the Latin American immigrant community of Boyle Heights, just east of downtown Los Angeles, California. This small church with a giant heart is known for its restorative justice ministries and faith-based community organizing and for being the home parish of Homeboy Industries. Ellie holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's in pastoral theology from Loyola Marymount University. She was commissioned as a pastoral associate for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles in 2013. Inspired by the prophetic role of grandmothers, mothers, and women and girls in bringing forth God's dream for God's people on earth, Ellie has preached for Catholic Women Preach in 2018 and 2020. She recently moved to Miami, Florida to live closer to her family. Our next speaker is Luke Hansen. He's worked as a teacher, journalist, prison chaplain, and university chaplain. He is an MA in social philosophy from Loyola University, Chicago, a master's of divinity from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, and a licentiate in sacred theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He has studied the history of women as deacons and the rest restoration of the permanent diaconate at the Second Vatican Council. He has served as a contributing editor for the Jesuit journals America and La Civilta Cattolica in Rome. He reported from the synods of bishops in Rome in 2015, 2018, and 2019, and he has won several awards from the Catholic Press Association for his writing. He is a board member of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. And our third speaker, Casey Stanton, has spent over a decade working in the field of social concerns ministries within parish life and as part of the broader faith-based coalitions. She most recently served as adult faith formation minister at Immaculate Conception Parish in Durham, North Carolina. She holds a BA from the University of Notre Dame and a Master's of Divinity from Duke Divinity School, where she graduated with a certificate in prison studies. A Boston native, Casey is proud to make a home in Durham, North Carolina with her husband and their two children. She is a product of Sacred Heart Education and invokes St. Madeline Sophie Barat along with Dorothy Day to accompany her in helping to lead and shepherd this new project. 
This is a wonderful presentation we have lined up for you today. So welcome, Casey. Welcome, Ellie. Welcome, Mook. And Ellie, I'm going to pass it off to you to begin tonight's presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Megan. And many thanks to everyone who has made the time to come here and be with us today. We're just delighted to get to speak with you. And as we begin our conversation, we just want to take a moment to center ourselves and to recognize that today the church recognizes the feast day of St. Catherine of Siena. She lived in the 14th century and lived into her call to be a force for good during a tumultuous time. In fact, she wrote hundreds of letters to the Pope, to bishops, to kings, counseling them on their responsibility to make peace and to restore unity in the church. She both loved her church and cared about the world. And the church has recognized and received St. Catherine's wisdom. She is one of only four women who are recognized as a doctor of the church. So anyway, it's fitting that we get to present with you all today on this day. And to note that in the gospel for today at mass, the scripture is from John. And after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet, he invites them to go out and do the same for others. And then he says, amen, amen, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So I invite you into this moment of prayer as we seek the intercession of St. Catherine over this gathering tonight. May we all preach the truth as if we had a million voices and may we answer God's call to be who we are meant to be and to set the world on fire with God's love. And so Lord, we thank you for all the people that you have gathered here. Bless us with the courage and the peace to have the conversations that will help move our church forward, enlivened by mission, as we respond with joy and faith to the pressing needs of our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so now I'm going to invite my colleague, Luke. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, it's just a great gift to be with all of you uh, this evening. When I studied and worked in Rome for two years, I lived only two blocks from the Basilica where St. Catherine's body lies. And I visited her often praying for inspiration and guidance in this work. And I know that she's with us this evening. And today she has this powerful invitation and challenge for all of us together as a church. Be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. So who are we meant to be as a church? What is God's dream for us? And what will enable us to set the world on fire? I believe these questions are at the heart of what we're exploring this evening. In so many ways, our church already embodies God's dream of love, mercy, and healing. And it's often through the extraordinary and unrecognized work of women in every part of the world at the frontiers. And in some really significant ways, our church can obscure and hinder God's dream when we remain behind locked doors, afraid to recognize the gifts and call of women. And that makes me sad, frustrated, and even angry. I've experienced a call to live close to God's dream for our church and to share it with others. And I have this perhaps inexplicable hope that our church can and will change even beyond what I can imagine. This hope can feel dangerous, it can feel risky, yet it's a gift from God and I'm staking my life on it. Nothing is more important to me than our church living more fully into its vocation. To fly with both wings, to breathe with both lungs, to receive and empower the gifts of every person. We know the world needs it. So the ministry of deacons, of men and women in this ministry, is one important pathway 
for God's renewal of the church and the healing of the world. It's not everything, but it's an important part of God's dream. So that's why I'm here. So just a word about the plan for the evening. I'm gonna spend the next few minutes uh, setting the context and talking about where we're coming from in terms of ancient history and more recent events. And then Ellie's gonna describe where we are today, offering perspective from the witness of the church today. And then Casey's gonna take up where we're going, uh, introducing the vision and plan of discerning deacons and how we can bear witness collectively. And then after each of us has spoken, we'll have time for questions. So where are we coming from? From the very beginning of the church, the ministry of deacons has always responded to pastoral needs in the ministries of liturgy, word, and charity. And in the New Testament, the only person who is given the title deacon is Phoebe. St. Paul commends Phoebe to the church in Rome, calls her a diakonos of the church at Sencre, and asks that the church in Rome receives her in the Lord. Now, Origen, who was a, a third century Christian scholar, he believed that this passage in Romans showed with apostolic authority that women were designated for the church's ministry and that Phoebe had been installed in this office. Now, I've got a couple icons here, and these two women are both deacons and saints, St. Tatiana of Rome and St. Nona of Nazianzen. For the first 11 centuries of the church's life, thousands of women were called deacons as they baptized and anointed women, proclaimed the gospel, preached, taught catechism, assisted at the altar, administered finances, assisted in marriage annulment investigations, and cared for women at the margins. And there are ordination rites for women deacons in which the bishop lays hands, invokes the Holy Spirit, and gives the woman the diaconal stole and chalice. So why aren't women ordained as deacons today? By the 12th century, the diaconate became a transitional ministry for future priests. And since women could not become priests, they could no longer be ordained as deacons. About 50 years ago, however, the diaconate was restored as a lifelong ministry and it was open to married men. How did this change come about? Deacon Bill Deitwig tells the story in the book, The Emerging Diaconate. Now, Bill was the head of the U.S. Bishop's Office for Deacons, and he's one of the advisors to our project. So what happened? In the early 20th century, an idea began to spread in the German Caritas movement that, that the diaconate as a permanent vocation could be restored. And toward the end of World War II, some Catholics saw the ministry of deacons as a necessary part of church renewal, and it could serve a world with tremendous needs. A young forestry worker in Freiburg, Hannes Kramer, felt called to the diaconate. And when he shared this call with his bishop, the bishop responded that it wasn't possible. Since Hannes was married, and only future priests could become deacons. So what did Hannes do? In 1951, he founded the first diaconate circle. The members, which included men and women, lived the diaconal vocation. Each week, the group engaged in ministries of charity and also explored the possibility of a renewed diaconate in the church. Within a decade, 30 diaconate circles emerged in various places, including France, Austria, and Latin America. They were building something at the grassroots. Then, as we know, Pope John XXIII called a council. As Vatican II took place, members of the diaconate circles moved to Rome and served as a resource for the bishops who knew little about this distinct and ancient order of ministry. And the presence of these diaconal circles made a difference. 
1965, the council decreed that the diaconate should be restored as a permanent state of life. This was in the document Ad Gentes. So the quote is here. There are men who actually carry out the functions of the deacon's office. So it's only right to strengthen them by the sacramental grace of the diaconate. So since the diaconate circles had already laid the groundwork, the first ordinations of married men to the diaconate took place in Germany within a year of Pope Paul VI giving official approval. This history speaks to what we're doing in this project and what we're doing here tonight. Years before this ministry was officially restored, the people of God were meeting together, praying, studying, and engaging in diaconal ministry. And today we know that many women are already doing the work of deacons, and Ellie's going to describe that work. So this leads to a question. Might the restoration and renewal of the diaconate include recognizing the diaconal work of women and ordaining them to this ministry so they too can be strengthened by the grace of the sacrament. In recent years, synods of bishops and papal commissions have been discerning this very question. For example, in 2015 at the Synod on the Family, the Archbishop President of the Canadian Bishops Conference, who's pictured here, he proposed opening up a process for ordaining women as deacons. In 2016, following a request from the International Leadership Group of Religious Women, Pope Francis established a commission to study the question. And Sister Carmen Samu, who's pictured here, explained, we are already doing so many things that resemble what a deacon would do although it would help us to do a bit more service if we were ordained deacons. In 2019, the Amazon Synod repeatedly affirmed that women are already doing the work of deacons and several bishops at the Synod made strong statements in favor of ordaining these women. One bishop said that the women who are doing ministry in his diocese, quote, already know that if the Pope opens the possibility, I will ordain them. In their final document, the Synod asked to share their experiences and reflections with the Papal Commission on Women Deacons. And Pope Francis immediately responded to that request. That was a formal request that the Synod made in their uh, final document. You can see them in the assembly here. The Pope immediately responded in his closing comments at the Synod, I pick up the challenge. There's a glove somewhere that's been thrown down. The women have put up a sign and said, please listen to us. May we be heard. And I pick up that gauntlet. When Francis said that, you can watch a video of the room filling with applause. The next day, a Catholic News Service interviewed Bishop Robert McElroy about the Synod. And he said that the majority of bishops were in favor of admitting women to the permanent diaconate, and he hopes they would find a pathway to make that a reality. So one year ago now, in response to the Amazon Synod, Pope Francis established a new commission to study the question. And due to the pandemic, the work of commission, the work of that commission was delayed, but they're going to begin meeting this fall. So clearly this question of women and the diaconate is an active discernment in our church. And we know that in a participatory and listening church, it's a discernment for the entire people of God to dream together, to pray and study together, to discern together what new paths the spirit is revealing to the church. So now my colleague Ellie, is going to talk about uh, the diaconal witness of women in the church today. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. So I'm here tonight and I'm doing this work with discerning deacons because I had the great joy 
to work as a pastoral associate at Dolores Mission Church in East Los Angeles and to work directly with extraordinary mothers and grandmothers who were committed to their faith and to their community. And working collaboratively with Father Greg Boyle and other Jesuit priests, they heard the call to be part of answering this pressing need in a community that was burdened by gang violence and there were homicides happening at the peak of the gang violence at the end of the 1980s and early 90s, almost one a week in the neighborhood. But working together, these women uh, um, were able to, to transform a community. And in the process, I was invited to preach at numerous parishes over the years to share Dolores Mission's story. And I offered reflections in my parish too. But even in my own parish, I sometimes felt a tension about how do we go about, you know, giving me the opportunity to reflect or to preach without getting the parish into trouble or myself into trouble, because technically in our time in 2021, women cannot be deacons and therefore we do not have an ordinary means by which to preach. And yet so many of us are hearing God's call to use our voices as though we were a million voices and to set the world on fire. And yet, and many of us have a desire to hear from the other half of the church on Sundays. I know that I want my nieces and younger women to know that their silence doesn't do the world any good and that they too can preach God's word to a world that's thirsty for living water. So before I tell you a little bit more about some of the women at Dolores Mission, I just want you to think about one or two women at your parish whom you think God might be calling to the diaconate. Perhaps you have personally experienced their gifts for preaching or ministry during the liturgy or service in the community, charity. So now let me just tell you a little bit about um, I shared with you, you know, the church uh, in the 1980s and the 90s being just um, burdened with all kinds of gang violence. And the women began to pray in different faith sharing groups, the mothers and the grandmothers who kept saying, our sons are on track for the cemetery or for prison. And answering the question, what would Jesus do, which was something Greg Boyle kept pressing upon them. They started to pray about this and reflect on this and step out of their fear. They actually organized into love walks is what they called it, or caminatas por la paz. And with their voices, went around the neighborhood singing, praying the rosary, approaching young youth in trouble, young gang members, and blessing them and saying, mi hijo, I'm worried about you. What can we do to help you get off this track? They started cooking for the homeless in the community, uh, or for even youth at risk who, who were hungry. Uh, there's a picture there of Father Greg Boyle taking young men to the cemetery to help them grieve the loss of a loved one. And so in answering this call uh, and working together collaboratively with their, with their priests, they were able to transform a neighborhood. And Homeboy Industries is now the largest gang intervention and rehabilitation program in the world. And there are more than 400 organizations around the world that are using the Homeboy Blueprint to help deal with violence in their communities. One of the things that these women have taught me over the years is that love walks. We put our faith into action. And I love this painting painted by Andrea Ramirez in East LA about um, Dolores Mission. And I think, you know, this is like an image of the kind of church we hope for, where people are gathering together in community to eat, where the youth are talking to each other, where women are doing safe passage, helping children cross the street safely, where people feel welcomed. Uh, there's another uh, painting I want to show you. This was by Fabian Devora. After he got his life together, he came back to the community and apologized for all the violence he had caused when he was a teenager and how much he had scared mothers and grandmothers and their families. And he apologized by painting this beautiful mur mural and recognizing the power of the, of the role the women in the community had played to help transform this community and to help young youth at risk feel that God's love was for them too. 
uh, one of the happiest days of my life was this moment uh, in 2018 at the Religious Education Congress when the women of Dolores Mission were invited to be recognized for 30 years of service to the community for bringing about peace and reconciliation and compassion. And they were recognized in front of thousands of people and invited to set the altar. And for me, this was a moment of like, wow, these women had lived the call of diaconal ministry for so many years. And it showed me like what Catholics can do when we answer that call and really strive to be who God wants us to be, the difference that we can make in the world. So now I wanna tell you a little bit about the Amazon because Luke mentioned the Amazon Synod and that has been the spark that has helped discerning deacons to emerge because th thanks to them, Pope Francis has called another papal commission to study women in the diaconate. And we know that there are many women serving the church in extraordinary ways in the Amazon and remote places of the Amazon, which include Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana. So I wanna tell you about two of these women. One of them is Sister Sidi Amis, who's um, working in Bolivia in the remote places of Bolivia where there are no priests because of the acute shortage of priests. And her bishop has delegated her officially, but you know, has delegated her this authority under an extraordinary exception to be the pastoral presence in many river communities. And she is preaching over the last four years, she has baptized more than 600 children and adults. She can do weddings and funerals. She can do what a deacon is essentially doing. And she is responding to this great pastoral need in uh, remote Bolivia because she heard the call and she said, yes. I wanna tell you a little bit about Doris. Doris Vasconcelos is in Brazil and she is a catechist and an activist focused on socio-environmental uh, concerns. And as you know, Pope Francis cares so much about us caring for our common home. And Doris is very committed to this and works to organize people to bring more attention, as you'll see in, in, in the next photo, to bring more attention to the plight of logging and mining and deforestation in the Amazon. And so much is at stake. Doris and the women of the Amazon and all the people of the Amazon having a voice, having a million voices is incredibly important uh, to the Amazon, to the lungs of this planet. And as we know, uh, there's so much in the next photo you'll see, um, I love this photo of the Amazon. This is the lungs of our planet. And we in Discerning Deacons, we wanna be in solidarity with the women of the Amazon who are doing diaconal ministry. And we want us to stand in solidarity with learning how we can care for our common home. And once again, um, to be able to live into this ministry that Jesus is calling us to in our times. So I wanna share with you a little bit about, in addition to listening to the women of the Amazon, we are also uh, working with a sociologist at Notre Dame. In this past month, we have interviewed and listened to more than 30 women across the United States talking about their ministry, their call, their desires to be able to preach or to do a bit more service if the church could recognize uh, the call that they are receiving. A lot of them are serving parishes and other ministries uh, as best they can overcoming obstacles, doing different kinds of workarounds because the, di the diaconate is not explicitly available to them. But as you hear their testimonies and hear their stories, you realize that there's more to be done in terms of allowing women to really live into God's call to be who they can be, to grow the mission of the church and to grow our impact in the world. And so now I'm going to uh, uh, invite my colleague Casey to tell you more about what Discerning Deacons is doing. Thank you so much, Ellie. And thanks to everyone who's on this call today and watching on YouTube. 
it's really such an honor. We've just launched our project this week, and I'm so grateful to the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College and this continuing education program to give us the opportunity to just get the word out about this project that's so near to our hearts, but we just believe that the ground is ripe and that there's many who are ready and excited to be called. And all of your presence tonight is such an affirmation of this work. So thank you for taking time to be with us. Um, so you've heard some of the history, you've heard some about the present that we're in, what's unfolding. Uh, and I wanna talk a little about the, the role we perhaps can play together as shared members in the body of Christ uh, in shaping the future for our church. I think as Catholics, um, it's hard to know how to faithfully engage in questions about our church's internal life and structure. Oftentimes it just gets played out in the media, which can sometimes just drive us into our corners and flame polarization and close down the space for robust dialogue. But it's still not always clear how we can operate um, and share the sense of the faithful to, and bring that to the leaders who are vested with formal decision-making authority in our church. So our project is trying to live in a kind of audacious space as we try to be a meeting ground. And we are deeply taking our cues both from history, from the witness of the diaconal circles that brought forth the permanent diaconate's restoration at Vatican II, and also the vision that Pope Francis continues to articulate. He consistently talks about wanting his shepherds to smell like their sheep and a church that's walking together. And this concept that he speaks of synodality, you know, he, he really believes this is, this is the future for the church. And so we are trying to be in the experiment of Pope Francis's vision to try to walk together inside of this current discernment about women and the diaconate. This question uh, came alive for me in 2016 uh, when that last, the, the first of Pope Francis's commissions was announced. I was at a personal crossroads. Um, I'd spent a decade working on Catholic Campaign for Human Development projects that were focused on social and racial justice. Um, I had finished my Master's of Divinity, uh, and I'd always imagined that I would, you know, help out at the church. You know, I'd been an altar server as a, a kid, a lector. I presided at liturgies of the words throughout high school and college. I was invited to give retreats. But mostly I thought of my vocation as being out in the world, serving and working for justice, being nourished by the liturgy, but really working out in the world. But the experience of being a chaplain intern at a women's prison changed all that for me. It woke uh, and stirred inside me an awareness of a vocation to ministry. But I felt like I was at a dead end. I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, you had to be ordained to be a prison chaplain in the state of North Carolina. And so I was sort of having it out with the Lord um, and then heard news of this commission. And the possibility of the diaconate immediately filled my spirit with a new sense of vocational possibility. It widened the horizon and it led me uh, to serve my local parish with tremendous joy. And I know I'm, I'm not alone in what that moment meant. I spoke with a woman last week who said that hearing that news of this new commission, um, she said after the birth of her children, it was one of the most joyful days of her life. So it also led me, in addition to, to serving in my parish in Durham, um, I started a journey of study. Uh, together with fellow parishioners, we read Dr. Phyllis Sagano's books. We used this marvelous study guide that she has prepared. And we learned that, you know, there's all this historic precedent. And it doesn't seem like there's actually a bunch of doctrinal obstacles that the church has to overcome. And um, so, you know, this could really be part of the renewal in the church. And as I learned more about the role of the deacon, this beautiful vocation um, restored at Vatican II for the mission of the church in the world, really felt compelled by where the deacon sits to bring the ambo to the streets and the streets to the ambo. 
And so as this discernment has continued in our church, now we are on the second commission under Pope Francis. I just can't help but feel like there's so many other folks out there who would love to see this happen or who have been praying for this for years or many who would be interested but don't even know that the discernment is going on. So one thing I've been grappling with is what does it mean for us if we're supposed to pray with our feet? If this is indeed something that we've been studying and praying and hoping for, do we just think there's some kind of magical process by which those who are tasked with leading and shepherding our church come to know what it is that's on our hearts and in our prayers? What if we, as part of the flock, have a responsibility to bear witness, to gather others and share the good news? How can we bear witness together? What is it that we need to learn? How do we do this thing of walking on a journey together? So this is why we have launched Discerning Deacons. This is our mission, to engage Catholics in this active discernment of our church about women in the diaconate. And this is our vision. We embrace this call and ministry of the deacon for our church, and we witness this diaconal ministry of Catholic women. And we hope and trust in the fidelity of the Holy Spirit to lead us in this discernment and to renew the church. All that said, we are truly not trying to come and just tell bishops and the Pope what we think they should do. We genuinely want to live into Francis's vision for a church to, to learn what it is to walk together, to not be afraid to bear witness with our leaders. I wonder how often we do operate out of our own fear, shutting down the possibility of a conversation before we've begun. One woman who's a part of our team, um, you know, participated in her local bishop synod back before, this was pre-COVID times, um, and she approached her bishop and shared with him that she really had been wrestling and grappling and felt this call to the diaconate, that this vocation seemed to align with her own life and gifts um, and that she wanted to be able to discern it with him. She wanted to be accountable to the church. She wanted to be in relationship with the church. She wasn't trying to just go rogue. And that was a real uh, awakening or an encounter um, for this bishop. He was sort of stopped in his tracks and said, I've, you're the first woman I've met who shared that she had a call to the diaconate. So from this moment of encounter, it's planted seeds to begin to grow the conversation in their own diocese. And as Pope Francis has said again and again, that we shouldn't be afraid, that, um, we, that fear closes doors, and, and we, should, we should try to um, trust in the movement of the Holy Spirit, um, even as it's trying to surprise us and do a new thing. So the question I have is, you know, how, how do we have this conversation? Um, how do we just ask the question, what difference would it make in my own parish, in the parish that you're in, in your university ministry, for women to be ordained as deacons? What concerns does it raise? What might unfold if we ask the question? So this is part of our plan uh, as discerning deacons. We want to go on this journey to pray, to learn, and to witness together. Um, so one thing that we're doing is trying to help in the learning. Now, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to help bring people up to speed. So if you were to go to our website tonight and click on learn, you would find this lovely introduction summary that would take five minutes to read. Um, and we're also in conversation with the press to distribute a little pamphlet that we hope could go out to parishes all across the country um, as a way to ground the conversation. What are the key things we need to know about the history and the theology? Um, and how can we share the fruits and synthesize the scholarship that's been done to help people know that this is a live conversation today? But we don't want people to stop there. We can be tempted, I think especially as Catholics, to stay in the learning mode and to tell ourselves that we don't know enough to start to talk to other people or to act.
But that's why in the Discerning Deacons Project, we have a bold goal and we are trying to create clear pathways to draw others into this conversation and learning. We wanna organize 1500 Catholics in and through house meetings and parish dialogues throughout the summer. And then we do wanna just gather the fruits of these conversations. You know, what themes emerge? What are we hearing? What are our hopes and prayers? What, what has this helped us to see? Um, and share that, prepare a reflection for the Holy Father, for the members of the, the Papal Commission before they start doing their work later this fall. And also to share with our local clergy and bishops to open up the conversation. So these house meetings are aimed at creating this conversation. What would it mean for us in this place? Next, we want to be a space where we can gather up the witnesses. As I said, I think there are so many folks out there. And as we've been in early conversations, um, it's been amazing to hear all the, all the ways in which people have just been waiting for an invitation to share that they would love to let the Pope know that this is a hope that they have. Um, and that we would have we would have their back if they tried to make this move. We know change is risky and hard and complicated always. And so we want to gather up a witness, the witness of women who are ready to serve and already serving as they share their stories of ministry, the witness of our leaders like Bishop Calvo and um, Bishop, I mean, our provincial and Jesuit West, Scott, uh, Father Santa Rosa. I might have said his name wrong, Ellie. Um, I want to gather up these witnesses of those who've been praying for this and hope for this in the church. I want to hear the stories of priests who would share, you know, what difference would it make in my own parish context to be ministering alongside women who are ordained as deacons. And then finally, this year, we want to witness together. So we want to collect all these disparate witnesses, we want to have all these conversations, and then we want to come together. So even if the 221 of us who are on this call today each came and maybe we each brought two others, we would begin to have a mighty witness coming together on the Feast of St. Phoebe. Um, September 3rd, Friday, 7 p.m. And we want to prepare to send our own letters and witness and reflection to Rome under the patronage and intercession of St. Phoebe. We would pray that the church in Rome would receive women's call in the Lord and come to ordain, to order that call as deacons. So tonight, if any of this has been compelling, I invite you to save the date to mark your calendar, perhaps to go on and peruse the website and subscribe to the newsletter Better yet, to join a welcome call in the coming weeks when we'll um, help a call and equip and send people out on Pentecost to lead these house meetings all summer long. And one final word, this week as we launch, I am um, just filled with so much hope. The zeal that St. Catherine of Siena inspires in so many of us who look to her witness as an example that as we seek this power to proclaim Christ's gospel, we remember that the one who we put to death has undone the power of death through his resurrection. And this risen Jesus stands by our side every day to strengthen, encourage, and console us. So we do desire to stay near in this process of discerning deacons near to the heart of Jesus. So we stay nimble and flexible and open and also try to remain clear in our mission and purpose and focus. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we take your questions, um, which we're excited to get to, just wanna invite you to take a deep breath. We've been talking at you for a lot of minutes and I just invite you to consider for a moment, invite the Holy Spirit to draw your attention to where you felt most alive in this conversation. What is it that landed for you or spoke to your heart? What troubled you?
And then as we launch into questions, we have a few questions for you. Um, we have a super short poll that um, will launch. And if you just want to take a moment and respond to it, um, it's a chance for us to know where you're at. We're planning to ask very similar questions to deacons throughout the country, and we just would love to hear from you. So I hope you um, respond to the poll. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was distracted by the positive polling. <laughs> um, somebody had just posted in, in the Q&A that they wish the chat was open so they could show their overwhelming support. So this was a perfect time to, to do the poll. So um, thank you so much. I think um, myself and, and everyone feels your passion and your hope and it's contagious. And so so thank you for, for preparing such a well organized uh, presentation. We're going to I'm going to try to combine some questions because there's some that are similar. And a question that has come up in a couple of different ways are kind of like barriers that might get in the way as we as we move towards these conversations, particularly um, dioceses that might have more traditional leadership in their in their bishops, their priests, their lay leaders, or even cultural barriers that might come into play. Hmm. That's a great question. I think um, one thing we're trying to do um, is become a community doing this work so that none of us are walking alone. So I wouldn't actually recommend to everyone that the call they should make tomorrow is to their local bishop. <laughs> that might, that, I know I shared a story of that, but that actually isn't the place maybe to start. Start by thinking about like, who do you already know? Who could we begin a conversation with? And how can we shepherd a conversation strategically, thoughtfully? Um, how do we need to prepare the ground? And I think that's gonna look like the quote from St. Catherine Siena, you know, there's gonna be a million different expressions of this. And so we wanna offer sound resources. Here's facts, here's research, here's some reports that you can help stand on. And then we wanna be a community that can accompany one another as we try to um, discern how the Holy Spirit's inviting us in our particular places to navigate this conversation. I hope that wasn't dodging the question, but. No, I'm actually gonna deepen the question, I think, because specifically there's um, a question, and this is directed towards you, Ellie, by a couple now of, what about Hispanic communities? Um, you know, What barriers do you foresee? It's interesting because, you know, I, I've been part of a Latino community for 14 years that, that has very much appreciated the role of the mother and the grandmother to pass on the faith and to be able to witness to, you know, problems in the church. And yet, I do understand the conservative nature of sometimes thinking, oh, well, one couldn't possibly be a deacon. So part of what we're trying to do with the sociologist that we're working with at Notre Dame is to tell more in-depth stories because sometimes we just haven't even heard the stories of women experiencing a call and their own deep prayer life and how they're trying to do that even in the Hispanic community. I had the, the great honor and privilege of, of uh, getting to talk to five different Latino women from around the country including Miami and the West Coast and the Midwest about their call to diaconal ministry. So I think part of this conversation is making it safer and safer for us to be even be able to talk to our own communities. Thank you so much. I'm gonna leave the polling up for just a little bit longer. It looks like we're, we're slowing down. So if you'd like to get your answers in there, please do so and I'll stop it after this next question. Um, again, I'm gonna to try to combine this question has been asked a couple of different ways of who are we talking about when we talk about Women is it you know cisgender heterosexual women um, or is it is it broader um, you know what are you thinking or I'll, I'll leave it there I'll let you take it from there. So I'll I'll ask Luke because he'll know the canon he's like an encyclopedia. What is the language now about who can be a deacon, Luke? Do you remember? Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly uh, okay. which canon you were sure, talking. sure. Just like that married, it's open to married men. I think a dream that we would have is that 
say all persons are, you know, open to be called by God right now, as it is, it's the word men is in there and we'd be delighted for, uh, to be inclusive as it is. We live in a church where men's bodies are the ones who can be received into the sacrament of holy orders. And we would love to bear witness to the call that, um, we believe can go beyond what someone's anatomy is. And that is more complex in terms of how the Holy Spirit um, gives the gifts needed to build up the people of God that, so it's a complicated question, but I, I think, you know, we would love to see the church uh, adopt more inclusive language in, in the way it writes the rules around um, who is fit for ordained ministry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause in my asking the questions to share the survey results because I think that they will also um, share hope with, with everyone. Um, so hopefully you can see it now. Very strong responses, strongly agreeing to the first question and the second question. And then um, I think a lot of a lot of hope with, you know, yes, I'd like to do it. Maybe I'll do it, but maybe just not now. Um, so yeah, if you want to take a look. Thanks. And I see a few people saying, how can I help? And that's such a wonderful question. And I, I do just encourage you to join us for a welcome call in the next few weeks where we'll lay out a path because there'll be lots of, you know, we'll have different educational events and ways to be um, really moving this offline. As I was saying, I think a lot of this gets played out really in the public in a way that can close down uh, like having space to have meaningful dialogue. And so we want to meet you and engage and see your faces and hear your stories and, and think about what it would look like where you are to kind of grow this conversation in your own parish and, and, um, and different ministry settings that you're in. And just to, to build on what Casey's saying, we are recording this and it'll eventually be on the STM's uh, YouTube channel, be on our website as well. And so this is another um, learning tool that you can use in your own parishes or amongst your own family and friends and colleagues um, as well. Um, there's been a couple of questions about um, how the diaconate works right now as a step towards priesthood and how does that fit into your vision of, of women being ordained as deacons? take that question. So right now, the question on the table is the diaconate. So this is the question that Pope Francis has opened, and he's actually called a commission, two commissions now, in responses to women asking that this be studied. So for us, this commission will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we are in a historical moment where we get to participate in and contribute to the discernment of this question. And so that's why we're like all in, you know, let's be a part of this. Let's try to witness to this as much as we can, because this is the question that's actually being considered at the highest levels. You know, in terms of those of us who would hope that, that women could eventually be ordained to the priesthood, I mean, it's hard to know what difference it will make at the moment, you know, when, when women are preaching in the parishes and, and boys and girls are witnessing to, to women and men preaching and also being able to um, participate and helping with sacraments like baptism or weddings and funerals. And so I can't speak for where the Holy Spirit might take this uh, in the future, but all I can say is that right now we have the opportunity to contribute to the discernment on this. Great, thank you so much. As we head into our final minutes, was there anything, Casey, Ellie, or Luke, that you wanted to share? Would you rather a couple more questions? Take a couple more questions. Okay, great. There have been a couple scriptural questions as well. Um, one of our participants was asking about the word itself. So the, the New American Bible refers to Phoebe as a deaconess. Is that an in inaccurate translation of the word diakonos? Um, it sounds like this person's had conversations where it seems like deaconess is um, lessening Phoebe's place within the church. So the, yeah, the New American Bible, which uh, Catholics use and which we hear when uh, the readings are proclaimed at mass, 
Um, it translates the word diakonos as minister. So there are several translations of this Greek word, and part of it depends on one's interpretation of like where the ministries were in development at the particular time that uh, Phoebe was ministering. Uh, so there are some uh, translations of scripture that uh, translate it as minister because it was clearly like a recognized position. Um, it's a noun, it's a title that Paul is giving her. Um, there are some who translate it as servant because that is at the heart of what deacons did um, and at the heart of what deacons do in the church. Um, deaconess is actually the most infrequent translation because that word really doesn't appear until much later. Um, and sometimes it was used to refer to wives of deacons. Sometimes it was kind of used to put down the ministry of women who were serving as deacons. Um, so that is not the, the translation in the New American Bible, it's minister, but I think there are different interpretations of what that means. And I see this other question about other, other biblical passages that could strengthen mm. this. And I think it's worth noting that the diaconate is something that um, the early church calls forth this ministry as a need. It's not necessarily that Jesus, you know, while pre-resurrection names a bunch of deacons, actually it's the community figure out how to do life, you know, in the wake of his ascension, um, that the ministry of the deacon is called forward. And so I think, you know, we, we can do our best to try to understand the history, but I think that pattern is really relevant for us today. What are the needs of the people today? How are they, how does a, how would a woman deacon help meet the needs of the people today? Um, and, and that, that you know, Phyllis Sagano, Dr. Sagano is often, will often say that um, the church won't be denied what it needs. And it's our conviction in discerning deacons that part of what the church needs is to recognize the, the diaconal call of women today. And that that itself will be a recognition of the movement of the Holy Spirit and help us advance our work of, of living the gospel um, throughout the earth. Well, I think that's where we'll close today. Thank you so much for your, your presentation and thank you to our audience members for joining us today. I think we're part of something great that's just starting. Um, and so thank you for sharing with us uh, tonight as we talked about potential for women to act. And it's, um, again, this wraps up our last spring webinar. We hope to see you again in the summer. Um, thanks to the CE team for all of their hard work this, this semester. Um, and that concludes today's webinar. We hope you have a good evening. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank everyone. You Thank you.